Across Britain, there's a hidden network of canals, more than 2,000 miles long. Many of them cut through some of the most stunning scenery. And in this series, I've chosen eight canal trips, the very best, from the west coast of Scotland to the southwest of England. I'm going to take part, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be exploring their stories. Am I helping? Discovering why and how they were built. A spectacular piece of engineering. And looking at their impact as Britain moved into the industrial age. On this trip, I'm going to be making my way across Scotland, along the most dramatic and scenic canal in Britain, the Caledonian Canal. It's not like any of our other canals. It joins together three natural locks, vast expanses of water, as it makes its way right across the highlands. I'm going to bring to life some of this canal's extraordinary stories and get to grips with the engineering features that made it possible. I'll be finding out about threats to this natural environment and meeting some of those determined to preserve it as I cruise along the Great Glen. The Caledonian Canal was planned 200 years ago during the Napoleonic Wars to provide a shortcut for Royal Navy ships across Scotland. So everything is bigger than usual, including my boat. Right, hello, Welcoming Malcolm. me aboard is Skipper nice Malcolm you. Stewart. So we're all going to have a great trip, aren't we? Giving us a hand is first mate and chef Gordon Malak. Nice, Malcolm. You're fine. Lovely. We're at the start of a great adventure, right along the Caledonian Canal, which goes like a knife right through the top northeast part of Scotland. And it's really a ship canal. We're on a ship. The thing about this is it's so much bigger than what we're used to. From the moment you enter the Muir Town locks, you get the feeling that this canal means business. It's ambitious and could even be dangerous. Now, you fall in there and they get out your letter to your mum, don't they? That's it. How are we doing? Hi, John. Is okay. it all right? Yeah, yeah, good, good. Is this sort of a normal-sized boat for this well, canal? Well, the canal was initially designed as an industrial channel for vessels of this size. The building of the Caledonian Canal began in 1803, and it took nearly 20 years to build. It was such an important transport route that it was government-funded, one of the very first. William Jessop was one of the chief engineers. The canal builders used three natural lochs, Ness, Oich, and Loche, and joined them together. The waterway is 60 miles in length, a third of that is canal. William Jessop was thrilled by the prospect. The Caledonian Canal is now fairly begun, and a great number of men employed on the work. The hills rise to stupendous height. The chasm of the Ness and the Lochie is without exception the most remarkable in the kingdom. I estimate it will cost 22,000 pounds a mile. These engineers were highly inventive. When they encountered difficulties, the solution to a problem could come from an unexpected source. You can see the river running alongside the canal and that river, in olden times, used to run a mill. And the mill has a curious connection with the building of this canal. And we're going to find out what that connection was. When the canal sprang a leak, home mills on the outskirts of Inverness were asked by the engineers to supply vast amounts of tweed cloth to patch up the problem. Ruth Black is a traditional weaver. Hello, Ruth. Hello. Now, you're going to help us explain how this cloth was made to put on the bottom of the canal. Yes. It's quite straightforward. All these threads have to go onto the loom without being tangled up. Quite, but this is for the bottom of the canal. I think this is a bit too nice, isn't it? They wouldn't have bothered about patterns and colours and things no. like that. They'd have probably used whatever yarn they happened to have. But you've still got to weave it in just the same way, you've haven't you? have still got to weave it right. in just the same <laughs> so way. That's what we've got to look at. Tweed began as an everyday cloth. Before the aristocracy adopted it, 
and its appeal spread throughout the empire. This is our Hattersley loom. Yeah. This is only 100 years old, but it's not so very different from what they'd have had before. It's just faster. OK, now, we're ne the next bit we're going to try is <laughs> to see, see whether see, I can See if pedal, you can right? if you can pedal. You're and using I'm, the how foot. How quickly am I doing it? One, you're, two, you're going three. to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, well, you, you instruct me as if you were the so, conductor so, of an orchestra. Right. right. Are you ready? OK. All right, well, I'm ready to so go. So you have to keep going. I will. You just keep, tell me to keep just, going. Just keep going. Yeah, It'll yeah, probably yeah. jam. Oh, uh, will it? <laughs> Give right. it a go. <laughs> right, off we go. Right, you ready? OK. OK. Give me the instruction. OK. Left. Right. Left. The closely woven fabric laid out on the mud at the bottom of the canal provided a perfect seal. The canal stopped leaking. Oh, stop, 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 stop. Well, that was terrific, and we've we've actually got some material, haven't we? We've got a small piece of material, yes. Oh, so I'm a weaver now, is that right? Um, I think you've got a way to go yet, but you made a start. I, well, I think it's jolly good. <laughs> I've enjoyed that enormously. Thanks very much, Ruth. Thank you. You're welcome. After the mill, we carry on along the watertight tweed-lined canal, heading for Loch Ness. Now, the next thing you're going to tell me is that there's a Viking ship behind me. There is. It's incredible. There we are, a, a replica Viking ship. It takes all sorts, isn't it, to enjoy a canal holiday, including Vikings. That's an amazing vessel. That's absolutely fantastic yeah. to see, really. You can you also know. see here, can't you, why people were frightened of the Vikings. With yes. the sail up coming at you, and there'd be lots of them, yeah. you'd get a little bit nervous, yeah. and then you'd get a bit frightened, and then you'd run. <laughs> and then you'd run away. <laughs> This is the last lock we have to go through before we get on to Loch Ness. So this is the lock, if you think of it, which keeps the monster in, if you believe in monsters, which I, of course, do. That's the whole of Loch Ness. So this is it. Somewhere here, we've got the monster. Somewhere, if it's here, it's swimming. And it's very deep, that's the point, isn't it? 950 feet is the maximum depth. Is that just right down the centre? The whole apex as it goes down. OK, so if we're looking for the monster... That's where we're looking. We should look over there, right? OK. Right, now look, is that... Uh, Here we is go. Is that the monster? I'm determined to find it this time. I'm a real believer. We reach the end of Loch Ness and more at Fort Augustus. Sadly, I didn't see any monster, and in this strange light, I might miss my bedtime too. It's still light. We're so far north that it doesn't get really dark, even when it's just before 11 o'clock. I can't wait for this. I'm going to bed. Good night. With a hard day of pillaging ahead, the Vikings have to set off early. For many years, herring provided the lifeblood for this canal. Early in the year, great shoals of the fish would appear in the west, and they would then move around the north to the east. The fishermen wouldn't have to follow them. With hundreds of their boats, they could go through the Caledonian Canal to catch what they called the silver darlings. They were smoked and then turned into golden kippers. Tasty. Oh, hmm. Hmm. No. Oh. Delicious. Do you want me to pull on that? We are now leaving Loch Ness and heading for the highest loch, Loch Oich. There you are, you're promoted. Right, at last. <laughs> the engineers had to build yet another series of locks to get there. What's exciting about a canal journey is you get these doors which are about to open and take you into somewhere completely different. 
another world. We are on the highest point of the canal as we speak. This is Loch Oi. This feeds the canal. This bit is all natural, isn't it? Yes. Here on Loch Oik, we come across a poignant reminder of the once great herring industry. That was one of the last herring drifters to operate in Scotland. So what we're looking at is the end of that whole era. A complete era of herring fishing uh, ended up over there. Of herring fishing, this is it. At its height, the fleet could land over half a million barrels of herring in a single year. It's all gone now. Most of the boats are sadly broken up. A hundred years ago, it looked as if Scotland's foresters might suffer a similar fate. There was only a quarter as many trees as there are now, and there was little replanting. The Prime Minister, Lloyd George, pointed out that Britain had nearly lost the first war for want of timber. So, in 1919, the Forestry Commission was set up to ensure a timber supply. Now the forests face a new menace, the rhododendron. And I'm going to see how you tackle it. Hello, Marcus. Hello, John. Right, so what are you doing here? We, we take the rhododendron and we destroy them by burning them on the fire. Yeah, and what's wrong with them? They are an invasive species and they don't belong here. And there were lots of people, they like rhododendrons. Yes, they're very beautiful. But unfortunately, they destroy the other plants. They poison the ground. The they ground, poison the ground, yeah. Yes, and they're also very dominant. On occasion, on some of the big, bigger rhododendrons, they can wrap themselves around the trees and it'll break up the bark and eventually everything will fall victim to them because they're such a dominant right. plant. So they strangle the trees? They will do eventually. Tell me what I've got to do. I'm going to take part, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> right, tell me what I have to do. You, you'll have to. Grab a rhododendron and throw it on the fire. Yeah. So now it's down to me and a few others to stop the dreaded tree strangler in its tracks. You might want to hunt with this yeah, one. That's great. Okay. You right? Yeah, we're going. Well, they're burning all right. That's burnt, it's all right. Once it goes, it goes. So, what should people do if they've got a rhododendrons in their garden and yeah. they like them? The fine, you keep them in your garden as long as you don't let them spread. Don't let them spread. That's okay. it. There we are. Death of the rhododendron. Bit of a tragedy, really, but there we are. I can, I can see the argument. It's a strong one. Yeah. I always like them. I like them, too. Mm. We're now between Loch Oig and Loch Lochay, and I feel I've held back long enough. Can I have a go? Certainly, John. Are you, are you sure? Yeah, just keep, how, keep it pointing in the right direction. How tricky is it? Well, you know, as long as we keep in the middle of the channel, you know, we'll be fine. OK. Yeah, well, uh, John, this fishing boat is heading. This is the one stopping the night. Over. Who's that talking on that? They've just confirmed with each other that we are going to be coming along here for the evening. Oh, right, good. Okay. So they, they're expecting us. They're expecting us, But they're yes, probably they're... not expecting me to be at the wheel, are they're they? They're probably not expecting you to be at the wheel, John, no. you know, and no. they may scatter when they see the, you know, <laughs> you're in control of the boat. You think so? You <laughs> well, think... I don't know, you're doing not too no, bad, actually, so, you know. <laughs> I'm doing my best. After all my exertions, a bedtime cupper is all I need until another menace arrives, the Highland Midge. I'm not going to take them on. There are too many of them. I'm going to bed. Come on, down you go. That's what I like to see. Go on. We've got 120 feet of water below us. So that should be enough. The Caledonian Canal joins together three locks. We're now crossing the last of these Loch Lochy on our way to Fort William. It was here in 1929 that the little known Lochy monster was first sighted. Margaret and Tony Sargent, no relation, believe they got a great view of the monster 40 years ago. 
I met them at the very spot. Right, well, tell me what happened. Well, it was an unbelievable day. We'd come up from Spearn Bridge on our way to Inverness, and um, as we came round the Corrigar Hotel, ahead was a wake on the water. The water was flat calm, so you didn't get all this rippling then, and um, it just stretched in a line. And I thought, what is that? You know, it What just, did you actually see? It was just a single hub. It was about two feet out of the water. You could, have, you could have lobbed a stone on it, it was that neat. What happened with the picture? Why did you not, why could you not take it? I had this camera, yeah. which has all these, you know, fancy um, light readings and oh, so yeah. on. Oh, yeah, so you had that. you had to get right to get the picture. You're trying to look in here. <laughs> yes. There's the monster. That's right. I'm trying to relive this. And, and eventually. <laughs> yeah? And eventually I do. Yes, right. And to my horror and consternation, it had just gone down. It was coming near to the end, that was the problem. And I turned around and took a picture of the wake, which was very clear and very lovely, actually. It wasn't sort of light on the water or it wasn't waves. It was there definitely was, an animal. There was a spinal column, a distinct spinal column that you could see, a ridge right. running all the way down there. Now, what about your picture you got? Let me just have a look at that. This is the picture <coughs> taken from it, the, the bigger right, one. Right, so there we are. Let's just line up the hill. The, yeah. This is where the water folded off it's a single line, it's not one arm yeah. or two, it's a single line. And um, what time of day was this? About two o'clock. Two o'clock in the afternoon. Two o'clock in the afternoon. Thirtieth of yeah. September. So Lot was flat now. Lot was flat calm, completely yeah, flat calm. You're a primary school teacher, you are a secondary school teacher, so people tend to believe what you say. Um, and are they convinced? Well, we are speaking the truth. If people choose not to believe it, we're sorry for, for them, really, because yeah. we know what we, we saw. Know what we saw. And yeah. we don't know quite what it was, but we do know we saw it. We leave Loch Lochy and its monster and approach Fort William, our final destination. This is called Neptune's Staircase. Step after step, lock after lock. After our dreamlike journey, I'm being brought back down to Earth. In 90 minutes, I'm nearly back to reality. We've only got two more, is it? Two more to go. Yeah. Now, with all my newfound skills, I think I can honestly say I've cracked it. Well done. William Jessop didn't live to see the canal finished. He died in 1814, eight years before the canal was opened. It was completed by Thomas Telford. I'm getting pretty good at handling these ropes. It's almost second nature now. Sitting beneath Ben Nevis, Britain's highest peak, Fort William is the wettest town in Britain. Nothing to boast about, but it does mean that all the water flowing over the peat bogs has given this town something rather special. Whiskey. And as I'm here, it would be plain wrong not to sample some. Whiskey making is a bit complicated. You need vats and things, great smells. The canal brought in barley and yeast. You just have to add water and 500 years of experience as John Carmichael explained. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm nice to meet you, well. Mr. Sergeant. This is mm. our 10-year single malt. This is a beautiful um. little West Coast whiskey. Absolutely stunning. Now, should I gulp down a lot or oh, just a no, tiny no, bit? Oh, no, 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 no. All the best things in life. Take time with mm. it, savour it. You can never drink your whiskey too slowly. Really? Mmm. Just let it wash gently over your palate. Mm. Take your time with it. Strong, isn't it? Cinnamon, ginger, cardamom coming through. Really? Then the spice is going to disappear, soften. Underneath this, you're going to get some toffee coming through. And underneath the toffee, there'll be a little vanilla, and then just a hint of smoke coming through on the finish. Right, I think I've got the hint of smoke. I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure I've got the rest. That's on the finish. You've got a very well-defined palate if you're <laughs> picking up the smoke. I'm impressed. <laughs> now, this one has a classic Ben Nevis character. <laughs> it's pretty strong, isn't it? Absolutely, 58% alcohols. Shouldn't we have added a bit of water? 
if you want to add some water, certainly. That one is just a wee bit too strong to drink it's on a, its own. A bit too late to say that, isn't it? Isn't it sort of bad form to be drunk? I mean, I'm, oh, I'm not drunk. Oh, absolutely. No. So I'm not drunk. Yes, I'm just yes. um, feeling it a bit. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Don't thank me. It's been a privilege and a pleasure meeting you in our distillery. I hope you'll come back another time and try the next 14. Right. I will, if I can. Yeah, that's... Um... I would suggest I take over at this stage, but we better get there anyway. We've travelled 60 miles from Inverness, and I must say, I've enjoyed it. It's been a real experience. We finally reached the end of the Caledonian Canal. This is the last bit. There's that little lock, and then you go into the sea lock and the sea. We've come all the way from the east coast to the west coast through this brilliant, fantastic piece of engineering completed nearly 200 years ago. And from here, ships can make their way into the Irish Sea. Incredible to think that a canal built out of necessity should be so beautiful.